Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder at Family Office Association. Today, we're covering how to position yourself as an investor as the energy crisis unfolds. It features two great guests, Lee Gehring and Adam Rosenswag. They're founders of Gehring and Rosenswag. Before we begin, I would like to give a special shout out to David Talbot and the whole team at Accordia, our data integration technology partners for arranging today's great speakers. The energy crisis discussion is again aligned with our series on decarbonization blog post, which we've been active. How would you characterize energy policy in the US and Europe and how it has contributed to the emerging energy crisis? In a big picture sense, the last sort of 10 to 15 years, I think the big policy error has been this huge push towards renewables without understanding a lot of the limitations and problems in those technologies. Uh, And the limitations and problems really come down to the idea that they're not base load sources of power. So they don't generate electricity on a sustained basis the same way as a gas plant would or a coal plant would or a nuclear power plant would. Um, Now, the debate as to how much CO2 we would actually save if we went to wind and solar is a really interesting question because there's a lot of research suggesting that because they're so energy inefficient, we'd have to build so many of them that we wouldn't actually get a lot of the CO2 savings. But leaving that aside for a minute, I think presumably the reason these governments have been pushing a wind and solar mandate has been to reduce carbon emissions. Uh, But it's neglected the fact that you know, there's a huge, huge Achilles heel to wind and solar, and that is the fact that they're intermittent. And for whatever reason, we've just wanted to sweep that under the rug for the last 10 years. We've put in place policies and incentives to push capital away from oil and gas and towards renewables. Uh, and now we're up to a point where renewables in some markets are providing uh, a, a great enough share of the market for power there that it's becoming very destabilizing. Your research frequently refers to the fundamental laws of aerodynamics. Help our viewers understand some of the contradictions between science, policy, and implementation. If you look at something like natural gas or you look at something like coal, uh, there's a certain amount of energy inherent in that unit, a million cubic feet or, or ton of coal. And we ignite that, we help liberate that energy by burning it. And we then try to use the energy that is then released, in this case from heat, to do certain uh, functional tasks, notably to turn and spin a big uh, electricity generating turbine and dispatch electricity. So there's a a lot of realities that become very difficult to to get around. You know, when you look at how much energy is contained in a ton of coal, I mean, that is the amount of energy that's, that's contained in that ton of coal. Same thing with the thousand cubic feet of natural gas. When you look at wind and solar, you have to deal with the idea of how much energy is actually passing through the wind turbines and the wind blades, and how much can be captured and converted into usable electricity compared with how much energy is required to make that wind turbine itself, which consists of cement and steel and carbon fiber, and all of those things consume energy. And what nobody really wants to admit is that if we're operating in a fossil fuel based uh, energy system, which is to say we're burning coal uh, and or we're burning natural gas and creating electricity, for every unit of energy that you put into that system, either mining the coal, building the power plants, what have you, you get 30 usable units of energy out the other side. And when you move towards renewables, that drops to, could be as low as three to one, could be in some cases as low as one to one. Um, And people just have to acknowledge that when they're doing the calculus and making decisions about how much renewable are we willing to accept and what implications that's going to have to our economic development and growth. There's been this huge myth that we can go green, and by green, people mean wind and solar, that's going to create jobs, create surplus capital, and create a huge amount of economic growth. And unfortunately, that's, that's not true. Your work recently highlighted how the so-called super major oil companies have been shrinking from their former greatness. Describe how this has happened and what presence of activist investors like Engine Number no. 1 and Third Point may mean for the future of these companies. Ever since you know, a decade ago in 2010, 
all these companies are not spending enough to either replace their reserves, produce, replace their production with new reserves, and with the result that their production is, is beginning to decline. Now, the fact that, that the, those phenomena are going to become a lot more intense because of the various ESG pressures. And of course, you know, the ESG pressures first emerged in Exxon with, with uh, the emergence of a, 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 an activist shareholder group, Engine Number no. 1, who by owning 0.02% of the stock were able to replace 25% of Exxon's uh, board, direct, board of uh, directors. And already they are agitating for further, further uh, declines in Exxon's upstream uh, business. For example, you know, there's, there's rumors out that, that they're agitating, the board is now agitating for the cancellations of two massive natural gas projects. The one in Mozambique, the LNG, uh, LNG Mozambique project, and uh, the big natural gas field off of Vietnam. Adam, would you have something to add with that or completely concur with Lee? Well, I certainly completely concur with Lee. And, you know, I think that people need to understand that the big success in the last 10 years has all come from the U.S. and it's all come from the shale basins in the U.S. And that's really been uh, the, the domain of the small independent E&Ps. But the super majors are critically important when we look at oil supply outside of the U.S. And when we look at natural gas supply on a global basis, you know, these big LNG projects, these big offshore oil finds off uh, either, you know, in, in Brazil and off of Africa and the North Sea, things like that. I mean, that's all dominated by large super major oil. Um, and so what I think is so fascinating is when you start to look through the numbers uh, on what people are expecting for non-OPEC production outside of the United States, this cuts right to the heart of that. You know, this is really going to decimate and cut into the flesh here of, uh, cut into muscle of that non-OPEC ex-US production. And, and that's gonna be really important because um, you know, everyone's been paying attention to the shales for 10 years. No one realizes that that entire non-shale rest of world number has been under a lot of stress to begin with. And now this, I think, is the last uh, nail in the coffin for that. Much has been written about an impending shortage of copper for electrification. How can you help our viewers understand why this is happening and try to explain how markets might navigate the perceived shortfall? By you know the the, the early 1990s, you had a, a a global copper business where all the mines are you know, huge amounts of the, the the mining base was brand new, and depletion was not an issue. Then what started to happen as the we stopped discovering the new mines and we started to to basically uh, age our mines that we were that we were mining. They were getting older and older, and we were being forced to mine lower and lower grade copper. You mine your best copper grades first. Now, this is a trend that's been going on for a very, very long time, and it's getting much, much more severe because we're just not bringing on uh, a bunch of brand new uh, mines like we did in all the way through the, the 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 1980s and into the 1990s. So the thing is, is that is that the underlying uh, depletion of the copper business is is now basically beginning to eat into any new mine supply that's coming on. But what Lee just talked about, I think, is going to be the most important thing in the copper markets going forward. You know, we just don't have enough new projects coming online to offset depletion. On demand, there's really, I think, two major sources uh, of copper demand that are not fully understood. Um, the first has to do with emerging market copper demand. And that might sound a bit funny to say that's not well understood since you know, people have been talking about China for forever. Uh, but I think that people fundamentally uh, are improperly estimating what drives copper demand. And they're improperly estimating how far China has yet to go. What I mean by that is that most people focus on how much copper gets consumed every year. And that's an interesting metric. It's very important. But what is ultimately more important is how much total copper has been installed into an economy. Um, and the reason for that is that unlike energy, unlike oil or gas or grains, copper isn't consumed as such. It's really installed and uh, it persists. So it's like a capital stock and it should be treated as a capital stock. And when you look at an economy of China's size versus how much copper has been installed, I think it has about 120 pounds per person installed. Uh, that eventually is expected to go to 250 pounds if China's ever going to get 
uh, through its middle income trap, which it finds itself, you know, just at the early stages of right now. And so, you know, that means that Chinese copper demand can easily go from 50% of world supply up to 75 or 80% of world supply uh, over the next decade, just to get it where it needs to be, which is to say an economy that's about $15,000 in per capita GDP with about 225, 250 pounds of copper installed per person. Uh, and that, that's, people don't think like that. People look at demand, yearly demand. They say, oh, it's too high now. China's 60, 65, 70% of world demand. Uh, you know, it's not 75% of the world GDP, so it's too high. But that's the wrong way to look at it. It needs to get to 250 pounds per person. Every economy that is that large, uh, which is to say about $15,000 per capita GDP, has 200 plus pounds of copper installed in it. You simply cannot run the economy without it. It's needed for all the electrical grids, for all the power transformers and substations. Um, India hasn't even started its trajectory yet. <laughs> India is where China was or should have been in 2003, but it's actually even below trend line there. And people say, oh, well, couldn't that be that they're just sort of skipping a few steps the same way as maybe these telecom companies never went to the wire line? But you can't really do that with copper because, again, you're talking about the electricity infrastructure. You're talking about things that really can't be replaced or kind of worked around. So there's going to be a huge secondary uh, source of demand growth over the next decade coming from India. And then and nobody has that in their models. Nobody uh, is anticipating much in the way of India. And I should point out on the oil market, they didn't either. And then within 18 months, India went from being something that no one paid attention to to the second largest source of growth and the third largest line item in, in global oil balances, you know, almost overnight. And I think the same thing could happen with copper, will happen. And then lastly, people just don't appreciate how unbelievably copper intensive renewable energy is. And the reason for that is that copper is used in electricity generating and electricity gathering systems uh, in that, you know, the last mile. So connecting a house to the power grid, but the same works in reverse connecting each of those individual solar panels and windmills into a central dispatch point is very copper intensive. And you don't have that when you have a uh, large coal plant. You have one central plant and it dispatches the power out on its aluminum high tension power line. That's not what you do with a wind farm or a solar farm. So what we're starting to see already is that in countries like Germany and Spain that have had big renewable mandates, their demand trajectory looks nothing like countries like the United States or the UK or other parts of Europe that have had less, France, for instance, with less of a renewable mandate in place. So, you know, if you want to go down this path, what it means is that copper demand is going to be extremely robust for the next decade. Turning attention a little bit to, I guess I would call it soft commodities, does your firm invest directly in grains or do you seek exposure through agricultural supply routes? And before answering that, Perhaps you can discuss why rising protein diets and renewable fuel mandates might be both contributing to stronger demand for grains. So if we're changing the, the, the we're entering a period of much more adverse weather in global growing crop conditions, uh, at the same time, the global grain demand still is growing very strongly. You're going to wind up in a situation where at some point there's going to be some sort of weather event uh, it, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a global basis that really puts a huge amount of pressure, upward pressure on grain prices. We're beginning to see that already. You know, obviously Brazil has been, has gone through a, close to a year and a half of very, very challenging growing conditions. Um, and uh, you know, it, there's other places I can name as well. So we seem to be, we seem to be entering this period of much more challenging weather conditions at the same time grain is growing. Uh, demand for grains very growing very strongly. The way we love to play it, we love the global fertilizer industries. Um, and you have something else going on in the global fertilizer industries as well. Uh, premises, first premises, grain prices go up, farmers' disposable income goes up. And what does farmers do? They go out, they want to increase their application of fertilizer to produce more grain in order to increase their yields. So every farmer does that at the same time. So all of a sudden, the amount of Fertilizer demand increases as grain prices go up. What's happening now as well is because, you know, remember, the, most of the fertilizer business in the world is very, very energy intensive. Fukushima seemed to be the final nail in the coffin for the nuclear industry, what, about a decade ago? 
However, you appear to be very constructive on the future of nuclear power and uranium extraction. How so? Well, there's a few different things, and I'll get into I'll get into each of them. And you're right, you know, following Fukushima, that has been a, been a relentless bear market that's lasted 10 years now. Uh, and really, actually, uranium prices were falling a little bit before that. And peak to trough uranium fell by 90 percent from about 150 down to 16 or 17, and it, it fell over more than a decade. So any way you cut it, you know, a serious, serious bear market. Um, we like to invest in what we call unsustainably low commodity markets, and uranium definitely fits the bill. What do we mean when we say unsustainably low? Well, by the end of this bear market, there's only two companies producing uranium in the world, Cameco and Kazataprom. It was a duopoly. They still couldn't make any money, and they actually ended up shuttering their flagship operations, each of them, and reducing capacity because they couldn't even break even on a cash cost basis. That's a great commodity market to get involved with right, right on the outset. So, you know, you had this huge bear market. There's been not a nickel invested in the industry for over a decade, but why do we think that that's gonna change? Well, simply put, you know, if you're going from fossil fuels to renewables, you're taking a massive step back in terms of energy efficiency and surplus energy that we can then use as an economy to make things and grow. Uh, if you go from fossil fuels to nuclear power, you're taking what I would say is conservatively the biggest step forward in terms of energy efficiency since the early 1600s. And, you know, that, that's no small statement. Uh, what happened following and what happened then in the early 1600s, uh, basically the prior to that for thousands and thousands of years, the only energy that we ever used as a planet came from food uh, and, and a little bit of wood and food was for ourselves and for the animals that we used to help power the farms and things like that. And obviously wood was then used for, for heat as well as for a little bit of charcoal. Um, England clear cut most of their forests by the early 17th century. They moved to coal because that's all they had left to burn. That was like a three to five fold increase in energy efficiency. And that brought about basically the modern world we know today. Everything up until that point managed to grow a whopping 0.04% per year. Uh -huh. Since then, it's increased 55 fold in 200, 350 years. So you, know, you had this massive step change. Uranium compared to fossil fuels is the same as fossil fuels compared to wood and food. And so we stand potentially on the cusp of this major, major, major positive event taking place. Um, but on a shorter term basis, you know, even I admit that we're long-term investors, but thousands of years is probably too long for us. So if you want to take a, a shorter term view, um, on the demand side of things, you, you really have two things. You have the emerging markets, and that's always been what our strong bullish thesis on uranium has been based on the emerging market demand for nuclear power, predominantly China, but also in India, uh, also in parts of Saudi Arabia to help free up oil for, for export capacity that they're burning for electricity there, but mostly China and India. Uh, and if you just take that demand in and of itself, that's gonna overwhelm the mined supply of uranium. It's already happening. Uh, and the reason of course, is that we haven't invested in the global supply of uranium now for, for over a decade. So, so that has always been the incredibly bullish story, but now something else is happening uh, because Western perceptions about uranium and nuclear power are beginning to change. That's never been part of the bullish story. We frankly thought that, you know, you could have almost no interest in uranium and nuclear power in the West, and still this China-India story would overwhelm mine supply. However, things are starting to turn very, very uh, acutely in uh, parts of Western Europe, in the United States, and it's moving very favorably towards uh, nuclear power and uranium. Still controversial, but you have people like the New York Times and, and other very, you know, liberal uh, news outlets that are now starting to say, hey, wait a second, um, if we really are serious about reducing CO2, we probably need to find a baseload source of power that doesn't emit carbon. And the only one that does that is, is uranium. People have not yet woken up to the fact that it also is much more energy efficient than any type of energy we've ever used, meaning it'll create huge surpluses of both excess energy and then capital. Um, that yet, has, be, has not been fully appreciated, but people are beginning to realize that if we want to go to a zero CO2 type of a um, 
power grid, and we want it to be uninterrupted, uh, uranium probably has to play a big role. So we're starting to see a big sentiment shift in the United States and, and in, across Western Europe as well. Oh, what is the future of hydrogen? What people really talk about, though, when they're talking about hydrogen is the idea of green hydrogen, which is to say we'll take solar and wind. No one talks about nuclear, but solar and wind, which is to say, you know, no CO2 emitted uh, electricity, which I don't believe is actually true. And we'll then use that to uh, go through a, a, an electrolysis process whereby we split water into hydrogen and oxygen, and then we'll take off the hydrogen, compress it down to a gas, move it around in pipelines, and go through a fuel cell and recombine it with oxygen, releasing electricity when we do that. The problem is that when you do that whole process, okay, you're starting with wind and solar, horribly energy inefficient to begin with, and then to do that entire hydrogen cycle, you lose up to 70% of the meager amount or you know, the hard fought electricity that's coming out of the wind and solar, you then lose 70% of it. So it's akin to like, you know, operating with a bucket that has a big hole on the bottom, right? You're just, you're losing 70% of the energy in the whole ecosystem. It can never compete in an energy efficient manner. Will we see a hundred dollar a barrel in oil this year and perhaps $200 in 2022. Our modeling says for the first time in the history of oil, we could very well hit that, that unprecedented crossover peak at some point in the fourth quarter of 2022. And we, we've never been there before. So the thing is you combine OPEC's um, market, gain of market share and pricing power with the idea that we're now going to, for the first time ever, bump up against total OPEC, a total global pumping capability, which that includes all OPEC spare capacity. Final question. Can you share some technology breakthroughs that you can both see as meaningfully contributing to net zero and your portfolio performance? Sure, I can, I can, I can take that. So look, I think if there's any single big picture, the more work we've done on this, and, and we've done years and years and years of work uh, deep into this, and I think it's funny because we have oil and gas in the portfolio, and I feel like sometimes a skeptical audience might think that that means you know we're not paying attention to uh, things like carbon, but it's quite the opposite. We're paying more attention to it than anybody. Uh, we just have some different conclusions, but they're incredibly well thought out. So after having done this for years and years, the one thing that's going to make a big difference is if we can get our arms around nuclear power. And I know I sound like a broken record. We've talked about it three or four times, but it ticks two major boxes. And we're challenged to even tick one of those boxes today. It's energy efficient and it emits no carbon. So, I mean, the first thing that we need to do, if you want to talk about, you know, helping the world move forward per unit of time, let's just push on uh, people to really get educated about the safety of nuclear power because that would make the biggest difference. Outside of that, I think that looking at EVs and looking at transportation, automotive transportation is a really strange place to start with carbon. And the reason that that is, is if you look at personal, you know, personal uh, car transportation using uh, internal combustion engines, that represents about 9% of global CO2. It's an intensely personal uh, decision, you know, cars, most people's you know, probably second most valuable purchase. People feel very strongly about them. They have real concerns like range anxiety uh, and, and real issues about how much carbon you're actually able to save. And even if you were to save all of that carbon, as 9%. Now you're not going to do that, right? And our most conservative estimates going from, uh, when I say conservative, I mean, you know, giving EVs every benefit of the doubt. Uh, maybe you're talking about 15 to 20% CO2 savings over the life of an EV compared to an internal combustion engine. How long is it going to take to get to 100% EV sales? At least probably 15 or 20 years. And then another 10 years after that to replace the fleet out. So you're talking about somewhere in 2050 replacing you know, 15 or 20% of 9%. This is not going to move a needle any way you cut it. Today, steel represents 10% of global CO2. And there are techniques and, and technologies out there that can produce steel without emitting uh, CO2. Now, unfortunately, some of those technologies that have been put forward 
they require more energy than the typical blast furnace. And so that to me is a really murky area because you're trading off energy efficiency for carbon. Uh, however, there are some technologies that are out there as well, which I'm very intrigued by, uh, that actually can create steel with no CO2 emissions and consume less energy than the typical blast furnace. And that is what people should be focusing on. It's a private company. It's not yet available you know, in public form, uh, but you know, it goes by the name of Boston Metals. They just raised money from BHP, Valet, and BMW. And to me, that's probably the, you know, that nuclear energy, we could address 50% of the world's CO2 overnight. <laughs>